Hey, Retcon Raider here. Today's video is dedicated to Leroy Nukinson. Thanks for your support, Leroy. That said, let's get started. So, on Monday, In Exile decided to share the second official trailer for Wasteland 3. Running roughly 1 minute and 45 seconds long, it's called The Patriarch of Colorado. And while the first teaser trailer focused on a lighthearted tour of post-apocalyptic Colorado, this trailer took a much more serious approach. Now, before we get started, we do need to cover a few things. First of all, we are going to be delving into some pretty mild spoilers here. It's stuff that's readily available in a lot of the already released teaser material, but still, if you're trying to avoid all spoilers about Wasteland 3, then you probably shouldn't be watching this video. Second, a lot of this stuff is probably going to be showcased more clearly in the upcoming Wasteland 3 Alpha, so this might be a little redundant. Still, I've got some spare time and I do like talking about Wasteland 3. Besides, you never know. Maybe I'll end up pointing out something that you might have otherwise missed. Finally, we've also got to address the music for this trailer, which, for those of you who are wondering, appears to be a, a much bleaker cover version of Are You Washed in the Blood? by Alicia Hoffman. This is a fairly well-known Christian hymn, first written in Ohio way back in 1878, where it was quickly adopted as the marching song of the Salvation Army. It's hard to say how this song might actually apply to Wasteland 3, given that outside of the clown cult and the cult that worships God President Reagan, we haven't really seen any conventional religious organizations. However, it does make this video slightly problematic. While the original song is long since fallen into public domain, I'm not actually sure where cover versions fall on the legal spectrum. To be on the safe side, I won't actually play it in this particular video, but if you do want to give it a listen, then feel free to go check out the original trailer. I'll be sure to include a link in the comments below. What I can show, however, is the lovely narration delivered by the Patriarch of Colorado. Let's run through the opening real quick, and uh, then we'll take a step back and discuss what we know. Bring my fractious children to heal, while I will ensure the continued existence of your organization. Just be warned. Your trip to Colorado will not be easy. Alright, so this particular trailer is narrated by the Patriarch of Colorado, one of the most important NPCs in Wasteland 3. As revealed in previous teasers, some of them dating all the way back to the original Fig campaign, the Patriarch is the character who first invites the Desert Rangers to travel to post-apocalyptic Colorado. Although the specifics of this arrangement are still largely shrouded in mystery, the general gist of it is that the Patriarch wants the Rangers to help him resolve some sort of civil war between his own children. While the Patriarch is the undisputed ruler of the Colorado Territory, he's apparently not long for this world, and with all that power up for grabs, both his children and several rival factions have risen up in hopes of somehow securing his throne. The Patriarch fears that this war will not only endanger the community that he's spent his entire life building, but that it might actually escalate so badly that it spills over into the surrounding territories. At least part of the Patriarch's claim to power are a number of pre-war weapons that have somehow fallen into his hands. In an earlier teaser, the Patriarch actually warns the Rangers that these weapons are even deadlier than nuclear bombs, and he loathes to imagine what might happen if they somehow fall into the wrong hands. 
Now, looking at the visuals for this opening sequence, we can actually pick out a few intriguing details. First of all, this has been tentatively identified as Wasteland 3's world map. I do find it a little hard to believe that the standard world map will have quite that level of detail, but who knows? The developers have definitely stepped things up where visual presentation is concerned. Second, we can clearly see some sort of billboard in the background. While most of the pre-war advertisement is frozen over, we can make out a rather obvious catchphrase. It's meat. That likely indicates that it's an advertisement for Circus Barbecue, the pre-war restaurant chain that likely inspired Wasteland 3's cannibalistic clown cult. The third and most obvious detail of this opening segment is probably this thing, some sort of custom semi-truck equipped with some rather unconventional accessories, including prominent snow tracks and some sort of turret-mounted energy cannon. We've actually seen a few different vehicle designs over the past couple of years, and the developers have previously stated that our first vehicle will actually be this thing, the Beater. We've also seen a turreted Humvee, which was prominently displayed in the original Wasteland 3 gameplay trailer, as well as Morningstar, an artificially intelligent presidential limo that was unlocked as one of the earliest campaign stretch goals. Now, it's probably safe to assume that these vehicles will come in tiers, with the semi-truck fitting somewhere in the middle. It's also important to note that vehicles do appear to have modular upgrades, here, we can see the Desert Rangers squaring off against a truly massive robotic enemy. But behind them, we can also see what looks to be a semi-truck, albeit sporting some uh, rather different accessories. As for the Rangers themselves, these three characters are identified later in the trailer as Banshee, Shellshock, and Doc Nails. I'm assuming these are just default Rangers, likely the same characters that we'll be controlling in the upcoming Wasteland 3 Alpha. We'll come back to them in just a moment, but it is worth noting that Shellshock appears to be sporting a laser sight on the front of his assault rifle. That would seem to imply that weapon mods will be making a return in Wasteland 3. The next scene shows a single ranger running into a large building, one which we can easily identify as the Aspen Mountain Ski Lodge. Specifically, that particular building appears to be the Silver Queen Gondola, which was first installed in 1986. Inside this building, things get a little more confusing. I mean, obviously, we've got some of what you might expect at a Colorado ski lodge, like gondolas and vending machines, but then we've also got scattered bloody corpses and what appears to be some sort of robed wizard or druid with a long white beard and a purple hat. The figure on the left appears to be a kneeling prisoner, while the thing in front of him looks like a stag's head mounted on some bloody sticks. I'm not gonna lie here, I have no idea what to make of this. There do appear to be some bloodstains on and around the gondola, so... Perhaps a local cult is taken to using those as part of some sort of sacrifice ritual. I guess we'll just have to uh, wait and see. Next, we've got a short clip of shell shock running through some sort of enclosed compound. There's not really a lot to say here, other than that it's a pretty impressive internal shot, showcasing a handful of the interior props that we're likely to encounter in Wasteland 3. We can also catch a glimpse of the updated Slicer Dicer, which we previously got a look at back in the trailer at E3. It appears to be patrolling right next to a rather conspicuously placed red explosive barrel, making it fairly obvious how the player is intended to start that particular combat encounter. Then we've got an exterior shot, and again, aside from the snow and blood effects, there's not a lot to say here. We can just barely make out what looks to be a couple of guards positioned on the second floor behind the rangers, as well as what appears to be some sort of traps or physical hazards positioned just ahead of them. 
This, however, is where things start getting really interesting. This is our first real look at whatever cult the Rangers are currently going up against, and they come in two rather distinct varieties. These guys here, with the rather prominent air tanks, are apparently called breathers, while these guys in the rather bulky armor are instead referred to as crazers. They're both featured fairly regularly throughout the rest of the trailer, implying that all of these clips might actually come from the same general scenario. Another rather intriguing detail is that when the ranger first reaches the van, they're clearly wielding a sniper rifle, but they quickly switch over to what appears to be some sort of harpoon gun. They seem to use this weapon to pick off some of the roving guards, which might imply that the game will allow for some sort of stealth takedowns. Regardless, the scene continues as the rangers steadily fight their way across the battlefield, exchanging fire with additional cultists and, briefly, showcasing another potential weapon accessory, this time an under-barrel-mounted flashlight. Eventually, they reach a large set of double doors. Though this scene is largely unremarkable, it is the first time that Scotchmo appears on screen in the combat trailer. He appears in almost every subsequent scene, fighting alongside Ranger Team November. Speaking of which, this is the point where the trailer finally begins delving into some of the finer details of the new combat system, starting with what appears to be the same slicer dicer that appeared a little earlier in the trailer. First up, we've obviously got the conventional square-based grid, and as combat starts, you can actually see the combatants lining themselves up with that grid. One slight oddity is with Doc Nails down here near the bottom of the screen, who actually shifts his position a full two squares when combat begins. That's obviously not working as intended, but this is also clearly a pre-alpha, so we'll just cut them a little slack. It's also worth noting that the battle grid appears to include a sloped surface, just behind the slicer dicer, as opposed to consisting of nothing but horizontal planes connected with vertical ladders. As the combat grid is applied, it's also interesting to note that the corpse beneath the slicer dicer has a very prominent outline. That likely implies that it's a lootable or otherwise interactive object. As far as combat is concerned, we clearly see that Shell Shock initiates the fight by taking the first shot indicating that we'll be able to start conflicts using ambush tactics. Once combat officially begins, however, it brings up what looks to be a fairly streamlined combat UI, and things drop into a much more familiar turn-based format. Running across the UI from left to right, we can see the character icons, complete with numerical and bar-based constitution displays, the action bar, including a pit-based action point tracker, and the Weapon Reference and Selection panel, which clearly displays damage, action point cost, and ammo count, again with both a numerical and pip-based ammo tracker. I do find it a little odd that Ranger Health is displayed three times on the same screen and ammo is displayed twice, but I suppose a little redundancy isn't the worst thing in the world. Taking a slightly closer look at the action bar, it's pretty easy to figure out what most of these buttons are meant to be. The crosshairs are likely your basic attack, while the eye is your basic ambush or overwatch button. The bullet with rotation marks is obviously reload, while the revolver and wrench is your weapon repair or clear jam button. The backpack is almost certainly how you access your inventory. The only one I'm not sure about is the square-shaped reticle with a star at its center. This one only appears on Shellshock's action bar, so I'm assuming it's some kind of special ability that requires a specific piece of equipment or perk to use. This appears to be some sort of charged ability. It's about half full in this shot, but in a later scene, you can actually see that it's completely filled and surrounded by some sort of blue energy. After that, there's a brief clip showing a ranger firing a rocket launcher at a breather. Again, just like with the slicer-dicer fight, we can clearly see some sloped surfaces, 
in this case stairs, but we can also see some more conventional ladders. I have to say, I appreciate the fact that a lot of these maps seem to have built-in verticality. I also appreciate that it seems to be better integrated into the maps than it was back in Wasteland 2. Although obviously not the focus of this image, we've also got this curious green tube, which seems to snake from the upper level down to the lower, eventually terminating at what appears to be some sort of loudspeaker or klaxon. We actually saw a very similar tube earlier in the trailer, right next to an active flame trap, so I'm guessing that this is intended to mark an active security feature that the player might need to be aware of. Next, we've got a much more elaborate fight sequence between Ranger Team November and multiple cultists. Although it's easy to miss, we can actually see several damage and XP numbers all over the battlefield as combat is initiated. Much like in the Slicer Dicer encounter, this would indicate that the Rangers made the first move, only this time, the entire team seems to have taken opening shots, and they obviously also killed their initial target. Another interesting note here is that the player is controlling a team of three rangers plus one recruitable NPC, in this case, Scotchmo. However, we can clearly see that they've left room for at least three more character portraits down in the UI. This would seem to match what we saw back in Wasteland 2, where the character squad could contain up to seven characters at a time, including up to four player-made rangers, as well as three recruitable NPCs. As the player switches over to controlling Scotchmo, we can immediately see that our favorite hobo not only lacks the strange square-shaped reticle icon that Shellshock has, but he also has a small blue flag icon underneath his name. Back in Wasteland 2, the leadership skill was represented by a similar flag icon, so this would seem to indicate that Scotchmo is benefiting from the influence of a nearby leader. Aside from that, we can clearly see several of the overall improvements made to the combat UI. We've got clear indications of Scotchmo's travel path, the action points his movement will cost, and a preview of both which enemies he'll be able to see, as well as his overall chances of successfully hitting each target. As he shoots his target, killing it in a single shot, Notice how his shotgun also seems to destroy some of the cover along his line of fire. This would indicate that the game will in fact include at least some destructible terrain, but that, much like in Wasteland 2, it's largely just restricted to things like explosive barrels and specially marked cover objects. As combat progresses, we get a glimpse of the ambush mechanic in action, as both Banshee and Shellshock pick off two additional cultists, who enter or otherwise take actions in their respective lines of sight. Notice that Banshee actually gains slightly more experience points than the rest of his team. This would seem to indicate that one of the ranger's perks or attributes is likely granting him bonus experience. Back in Wasteland 2, that was one of the benefits of having a higher charisma score. One final detail we can glean from this scene are some of the weapons being used by Ranger Team November. Shellshock, for example, appears to be equipped with an AR-10 assault rifle and a Mac-10 submachine gun, while Banshee is instead wielding some sort of heavy sniper rifle and what appears to be a 9mm semi-auto handgun, possibly a Glock. Scotchmo is wielding what might be a lever-action shotgun, but his offslot has our very first melee weapon, what appears to be an absurdly stylized karambit, a rather exotic knife that's been popularized in games like CSGO. Next, the trailer briefly showcases Wasteland 3's planned targeted shot system, which will allow the player to target specific parts of their opponents. Although not quite as granular as the targeting system in games like Fallout or Phoenix Point, it does allow the player to target an opponent's arms, legs, body, or head. In this case, striking a target's arms will significantly reduce the damage that it can inflict, while striking the target's legs will instead reduce its overall movement range. Striking the target's body will apparently completely destroy its armor, 
while successfully striking it in the head, will simply inflict twice the normal amount of damage. Then, we've got our very first glimpse of the game's planned inventory system, and there's a lot to take away here. First, we've got the tabs up top. Inventory, Attributes, Skills, Perks, Map, Mission Log, and Fame and Reputation. Most of these are carried over right from Wasteland 2, but the Fame and Reputation tab is new. That seems to indicate that Wasteland 3 will feature a much more in-depth reputation tracking system, perhaps something on par with what we saw in the original Fallout games. Another new feature appears to be the Crafting button, positioned at the very bottom of the screen. Again, this is a feature that wasn't present in the previous two games. This is actually the first we're hearing anything about a crafting system in Wasteland 3, so it's honestly a pretty pleasant surprise. Perhaps the most prominent detail here is the 8-slot equipment system, which is a significant step up from the 7-slot system featured back in Wasteland 2. Although it's not widely known, some of the earliest builds in Wasteland 2 included placeholders for a multi-slot armor system, with the very first backer build featuring modular armor pieces such as ballistic vests, camo pants, and spiked helmets. Sadly, this concept was quickly dropped in later builds, in favor of a much simpler consolidated armor slot. In Wasteland 3, however, the multi-slot armor system appears to be making a comeback, as evidenced here by the complete lack of a dedicated armor slot. The only other prominent difference is the addition of two dedicated belt slots, presumably for quick use or utility items. In this case, we can see that Banshee is carrying something that looks like some sort of portable turret, something which was definitely not featured back in Wasteland 2. Taking in the rest of the UI, we can pick out a few more interesting details. For example, Banshee is listed as a level 15 sniper, though the developers were quick to reassure us that this does not mean the game will feature actual character classes. Rather, this title is simply assigned based on the character's skills and specializations, with the title presumably changing if their specialization ever changes. It's also interesting to note that the XP counter down at the bottom of the screen seems to have more or less maxed out. This might imply that level 15 is the maximum level cap in the game, but it's more likely that this is simply a placeholder. After all, we do know that the upcoming alpha will not feature the planned character creation system, so it's probably safe to assume that it won't include the planned level-up system either. Then we've got this thing, the Plasma Bolter, which, at least thematically, might be inspired by the Wookiee Bowcaster from the original Star Wars trilogy. Aside from looking quite impressive, it's also the only man-portable energy weapon featured in the new combat trailer. Oddly, despite being an energy weapon, it's listed as requiring 8 points in automatic weapons. This might just be a placeholder, but um, it could also indicate that the energy weapon skill won't be returning in Wasteland 3. Aside from that, the rest of Team November's shared inventory is filled with about what you'd expect. Assorted ammo for their weapons, a handful of basic medical items, two bottles of snake squeezins for Scotchmo, a few grenades and Molotov cocktails, and a basic shovel. One rather odd item is this thing, which resembles part of a fishing rod or maybe part of a bicycle. Now, it's possible that this is some sort of improvised melee weapon, but I'm guessing it's actually some sort of quest item. Possibly part of the drawbridge that the rangers encounter right towards the end of the trailer. After that, we've got a brief clip of Banshee reloading his new plasma bolter, showcasing the nicely upgraded scenery and character models featured in Wasteland 3. But then we've got a much more impressive scene showing the massive energy turret on the ranger's truck in action. Like I mentioned earlier, vehicles will be playing a fairly prominent role in Wasteland 3. 
Not only will they be used to expedite the player's travel around the world map, but they'll also be at least somewhat functional on the battlefield. Although we don't know exactly how functional they'll be, the developers have previously stated that we'll at least be able to use them as mobile cover, and obviously, they'll also feature optional weapon systems, which can be deployed to rather dramatic effect. Then we've got the drawbridge I mentioned, closely followed by a scene of Ranger Team November driving into what appears to be some sort of radioactive fog. Back in Wasteland 2, similar clouds of radioactive fog were used to artificially restrict where the player could travel on the world map, at least until they found appropriate quest items to bypass it. For better or worse, this scene might indicate that we'll be seeing a similar mechanic returning in Wasteland 3. And that brings us to the very final scene of the trailer, giving us our first look at the Patriarch himself. I'll admit, given what we know of the Patriarch, that's not really how I imagined him. Still, he does look suitably impressive, and there are some rather interesting details on his character model. Now, blood and grizzled expression aside, he's clearly sporting what looked to be a couple of victory shoulder holster cartridge loops, complete with some rather absurdly sized cartridges. He's also sporting some rather distinctive tattoos on his left forearm, including a stylized bowie knife, bald eagle, and an American flag, as well as some sort of Roman numerals, though I can't actually make out the entire number. Slightly more intriguing, he's also wearing what appears to be a small patch of improvised scale mail, consisting of various gold coins and ingots. Given that it only covers a very small portion of one arm, I think it's safe to say that it's some sort of status symbol or symbol of office, rather than actual armor. While I can't seem to identify any of the actual designs, the coin towards the center does bear a rather striking resemblance to the Clark Gruber $20 gold piece, which was first minted back in 1860, during the gold rush in Colorado. And that just about covers everything. Like I said, there was nothing really groundbreaking this time around, but there were still a few rather interesting details hidden throughout the new combat trailer. Of course, I do feel a little silly. A lot of this is stuff we'll be seeing up close and personal with the new combat demo, which comes out in the very near future. So, until we actually get our hands on that, this is Retcon Raider, signing off. Thanks for listening. Oh, and remember, although I do love talking about Wasteland 3, you can find out more about the game by visiting the official website, the official YouTube channel, the official Facebook page, the official Twitter feed, or the original crowdfunding campaign over on FIG. Links are in the description.